what you were doing. Let me, uh, let me welcome everyone and, and thank all of you for, uh, for turning out tonight. I, my job is to introduce the introducer, uh, but before I do that, I want to say uh, just a, a quick word about why we're here tonight. And that is, uh, you know, a few years ago, a guy named Jerry Lenfest set up a, a challenge. And he said, among other things, that the faculty are the core of what Washington the is all about. Um, exceptional scholars, exceptional teachers, and the relationship that they form with um, the students who are here is really one of the hallmarks of Washington and Lee. And so the Lenfest challenge was to challenge the alumni and friends and parents and supporters of the university to um, help us recognize uh, individuals who have, through their careers here at Washington and Lee, really demonstrated those qualities that make Washington and Lee what it is. Uh, two of those individuals who helped us meet that challenge were Happ and Brooke Stein, who are with us here tonight. And through their generosity in setting up an endowed chair that will go to someone in either history or in the Williams School, we are able to recognize in the words of the endowment they set up, an accomplished scholar and an exceptional teacher. And you will see one of those great examples here this evening in a lecture here to come in a few minutes. But right now what I really wanted to do is just thank Happ and Brooke for making this possible. of our history department, Ted Delaney, to introduce the person who holds the sign chair. It's a real privilege and pleasure for me to be in, able to introduce Holt Merchant this evening. Holt is a very good friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, and <coughs> I'm almost not wanting to say what I'm going to say because I don't want to raise eyebrows and get people to be very puzzled. But Holt was my faculty advisor <laughs> when I was a student. And so Holt and I have had lots of different kinds of relationships. Uh, aside from being my mentor, my professor, my faculty advisor, he's also my very good friend. Holt, as you well know, has a Washington Lee undergraduate degree, and he also has a PhD in history from the University of Virginia. Most important, Holt is a Civil War historian and one of the truly beloved professors on Washington Lee's campus. In a staff meeting in the history department yesterday, I was telling them, telling my colleagues that when Holt teaches the Civil War class, he has to have two sections because it draws so many students. And typically, when he teaches that course, he ends up with two sections of 25 students. There's no other history course on the Washington Lee campus that draws that kind of audience. Generations and generations of students dearly love Holt, and all of you already know Holt, and you didn't come here to hear me talk, but it's my great honor and my great privilege to present to you someone you already know, Holt Merchant. <laughs> Ted, thank you. I really never expected myself to be in this position. Not just that I'm lecturing sitting down, I hate it, but I'm starting to get used to it. And I'm looking forward to the time when I can lecture standing up again. What really amazes me is the occasion. Endowed professorships are for people who publish multiple books. And I certainly don't fit into that category. Of course, it's all possible because of the Steins. Their wonderful generosity has, has, has made this possible. And my ego is swelling by the moment. 
I think I probably ought to explain a little bit about what I'm going to talk about so that when I talk about it, it'll make a little sense. A very long time ago, when Washington and Lee hired me to teach the Civil War and other things, I arrived ABD back in the, those days. We hired people without terminal degrees, and I was one of them. One of my favorite professors, Al Mosier, called me in and said, Holt, what are you going to write about? Well, I had practically just finished off my PhD orals, and I said, I don't have a clue. And he said, here. And he handed me the subject of my dissertation. I'd never heard of Lawrence Kitt. I very quickly discovered that I was going to get along very well with Lawrence Kitt. Um, The idea began with Ollie Crenshaw, uh, an, another of my favorite professors. He had just begun working on the biography of Kit when, when he died. And Al said, Holt, Ollie would like you to do this. And I said yes, and I began trying to figure out who Lawrence Kitt was and why I should care. And it turns out that he was a, a South Carolinian, a planter, a slave owner, a politician, a lawyer, um, a congressman, a legislator, and an all-around wild man. Uh, his rhetoric uh, got him into any number of fights. Uh, he helped uh, Bully Brooks beat up Charles Sumner. Uh, he helped start a fight on the floor of the Congress that at least three dozen congressmen all in a great heap trying to kill each other. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about Kit tonight. As, as, as I got into my research, I became interested in the young woman he courted and married. Uh, beautiful, wealthy, plantation belle very reluctant, as, as we'll see very shortly, very reluctant to marry Kit. Didn't like politics. Uh, didn't really like South Carolina all that much. Wanted to go to Europe and, and study art and music. And it didn't work out that way, and that's part of the story. If you historians are expecting uh, a historical point here, uh, there, there isn't one. <laughs> um, it's, it's just a story. Uh, I think it's good social history. It's, it's interesting social history. But if you expect me to attack one of the giants in the field and prove that he's got it all wrong, it's not going to happen. Sue Kitt was miserable. Her cherished plans for an extended trip through Europe had collapsed. And now in November of 1859, she was facing an uncertain future in Washington, D.C. as the wife of a fire-eating congressman. In the weeks that followed her arrival in the nation's capital, she poured out her fears and frustrations in long, unhappy letters to her family back home in South Carolina. The trip north from her father's plantation outside of Society Hill had been extremely trying. The weather had been, this is mostly her words, oppressively hot. The noise and the dirt from the locomotive had kept her from sleeping. The scenery in North Carolina had been dull in the extreme. The boat trip up the Potomac had been rough and she had suffered terribly from seasickness. She told her mother, I had the blues dreadfully coming on. I did so want to stay home this winter, for I don't like Washington, and I wanted to rest and ride and fatten up and keep you and father company. I like the fatten up part. <laughs> ride and fatten up and keep you and father company for a little while longer. Her new life, she said, was anything but agreeable. First of all, she'd been married only six months. And her transformation from a carefree, sought-after plantation belle to a dutiful wife was far from complete. The rooms her husband had rented for them at Brown's Hotel were cramped and dingy, or so she said. 
The food was bland and unappetizing. And when Kit went off to what she called that national bauble in the house, I think she must have meant Babel, but no matter. <laughs> When Kit went off to that national bauble in the house, she had nobody interesting to talk to. A great many ladies had called, but all of them insisted on discussing politics and bored her almost to tears. She told her sister-in-law, I detest Washington. I have never fancied politics and the talk of politicians. Here I have nothing else, she underlined nothing. I am tired out of old John Brown. Brown had raided Harper's Ferry and been executed very shortly before this time. I am tired out of old John Brown and the black Republicans and all the fussing and quarreling for the speaker. Sue probably wrote that letter in mid-December of 1859. John Brown had been dead for less than a month at that point. The fight to elect a speaker that among other things, caused one of the brawls that Kit got himself into. The election didn't end until February. Sue Kit was, and I've found, I've been able to find only one photograph, but in that photograph she is a remarkably attractive young woman. A reporter for an upcountry newspaper in South Carolina met her at a Davidson ball in Charleston in 1854 when she was only 19. He described what he called her magnificent form, her fair brown and lovely, excuse me, her fair brow and lovely arms, her flashing eyes, and pronounced her the acknowledged beauty of the PD country. And old Benjamin Franklin Perry, who was both crusty and a unionist and had absolutely nothing to gain from praising any, any radical. Perry wrote this. He talked about her beauty, the beauteous belle of, of the great P.D. In one of his first letters, Kit complained that public adulation was making his wife incurably vain. <laughs> In the summer of 1854, when Sue met Lawrence Kit for the first time, she could have married any bachelor in South Carolina, perhaps any bachelor in the South. She was beautiful. She came from a very prominent, very wealthy family. Her father was uh, Samuel Sparks. Sparks owned a plantation of 2,500 acres and more than 150 slaves. And so by anybody's standards, she was part of a very wealthy family. Sue wasn't at all eager to find a husband, and especially not Kit. And when Kit launched a, a, a remarkably aggressive courtship, she tried to push him away. Partly, I think, and the evidence here isn't what I'd like it to be, she had been caught up in an earlier engagement that ended badly. Kit talks in, his, in a lot of his letters about her, her wounded psyche. And I think she was reluctant to embark on another romance so soon after the previous one had gone on the rocks. More than that, she had spent a year at Barhamville Academy, which is a fairly typical experience for, for uh, a, a Southern girl from a wealthy family. And the experience had awakened her interest in art and music, and she was absolutely determined to go to Europe and study in Europe before she settled down into a life that she described as boring domesticity. So marriage, especially to an ambitious politician, she knew would shatter that dream seemingly forever. Kit refused to admit defeat. There is just a great flood of letters from him to her. Now one of the things I regret is that I, don't, I didn't find any letters from her to him. Now I'm not entirely sure what that means. Either he didn't, 
he didn't value them enough to keep them? Uh, I don't think so, because after all, he was chasing her. Uh, I rather suspect that somebody along the line burned the letters and uh, caused me uh, enormous problems. <laughs> Reading between the lines of his letters is, is not, perhaps not legitimate, but you historians out there know that we do that anyway. Kit refused to admit defeat. In the beginning, he had filled his letters with stories about the social life of the nation's capital. A grand ball at Willard's Hotel, a dinner with Jefferson Davis, a reception at the White House, but Sue made it perfectly clear that she was not your stereotypical Southern belle. Yes, she had a beautiful face. Apparently she had a magnificent figure. She certainly had a charming personality. She did not have a head full of fluff. She was intelligent and she was unwilling to pretend that she wasn't. And so she encouraged Kit to write about more serious matters, maneuvers on the floor of the House of Representatives, the history of South Carolina. He never wrote it because he died before he could, but what Kit really wanted to do was write a history of South Carolina during uh, the colonial period. Um, he was a good friend of William Gilmore Sims, and he he, he wrote about Sims novels. He sent her copies of Sims novels. Severin Duvall would have liked that. <laughs> so we have a, a, a woman who was insisting that she hated politics. We have a woman making herself an expert on the subject. She was actually giving him political advice. I don't think he listened. She invariably tried to get him to be more careful, and he was never careful. The courtship did not run smoothly at all. In March of 1856, during a visit to the Sparks Plantation, Kit proposed for the first time, and she refused him. And he proposed a second time and she refused a second time, and he proposed a third time. How many of you guys actually went, had to go this far? <laughs> she turned him down a third time. He proposed a fourth time. She turned him down again. But then there was a fifth time, and she, he, he really was persistent. And this time she succumbed, but she exacted a terrible price. She made him promise to resign his seat in the Congress and take her to Europe. And when they returned, if they ever returned, he must give up politics forever and become a cotton planter. And remarkably enough, because this man was a politician to his fingertips, he agreed. Kit wrote, I once thought nothing on earth could tempt me from the path of political ambition. But for her, he would give up politics, he would carry her away to Europe, he would stay with her there as long as she wanted. And still Sue hesitated. She set one date for the wedding, broke it. Set another date for the wedding, broke it. Set another date for the wedding, broke it. Sometime in the spring of 1856, she almost certainly realized that she didn't want to get married at all. She stopped answering his letters, and he complained, and she promised to write more often. She avoided his friends at home. Worst of all, at a party in Columbia, she snubbed his sister. His sister was, was badly hurt. And then in July, during the furor caused by Brooks Caning of Sumner, it all came out. She formally broke their engagement. And Sue didn't see Kit again for more than two years. She spent her time at home on the plantation nursing what Kit called your wounded sensibilities. And Kit threw himself into Washington's social life 
attending an endless succession of balls and dinners, escorting an endless succession of beautiful bells. There were a number of women who really wanted to marry him, trying to forget his lost love. For a time, he was the almost constant companion of her, Harriet Lane, who was mistress of the White House during the administration of her bachelor uncle, James Buchanan. She'll have something to say about him in just a couple of minutes. Sue apparently never forgot her congressman because in September of 1858, and I assume that Kit was responding to an invitation from her, Kit made what he called a little flying visit to the Sparks Plantation and the couple reconciled and on the 18th of May, 1859, the much delayed wedding finally took place and seven days later they sailed for Europe. And for Sue the trip was absolutely a dream come true. For almost five months she and Kit traveled throughout Europe. England, then France, then the Low Countries, then the Germanys and Switzerland. And in October she was ready to settle down in Paris for a winter of study, serious study she thought. And then in the spring, she told her mother they would visit Egypt and Palestine and then spend time in Rome. She said, Kit wants to return to Washington before Congress meets in December, but she thought he should stay away. He could avoid what she called the little disputes that were making politics so unpleasant. Well, the country was blowing itself to bits at this point, <laughs> and little disputes is, is a bit of an understatement. <laughs> and then, and here's a woman who doesn't like politics, her husband could go home in time for the next session uh, and allow himself to be elected to the Senate. If that sounds ambitious, it's going to get even more amazing very shortly. And it didn't happen. It, the trip didn't work out the way she thought it would because without warning, seemingly without warning, events in the United States simply destroyed Sue's plans, smashed them to a pulp. Late in October, news of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry reached Kit in Paris along with urgent pleas from his colleagues in Congress, you've got to come home, we need you. And of course, Kit went. Sue was absolutely heartbroken. This is a letter to her mother. For years, she, you can hear her wailing at this point. For years, she had clung to plans to travel and study in foreign lands. She had crossed 3,000 miles of ocean to see all of Europe, and now she had to settle, I'm quoting, for a little flying tour among the flat-headed Dutch and the disgusting Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> Egypt and Palestine, palm trees and nutmegs, Italy and Scotland and Wales, all sacrificed to the god politics. Well, Kit offered to let her stay in Europe. They had met uh, an American family they liked a great deal. It, doesn't come up later in the lecture, but the American family they liked a great deal turned out to be Yankees, and, and the wife, Sue, and, and the wife and this couple engaged in a ferocious letter writing campaign in, in which Sue accused the Yankees of, of, of uh, well, if you can think of it, they're guilty of it. <laughs> the, the union was going to bring guillotines in, into uh, the, the state house in South Carolina and execute all the legislators. That's one of the milder things she said. So Kid offered to let her stay, and she said no. Bitterly disappointed, she returned home. And it didn't get better at least for her. In Washington, life as the wife of a fire-eating congressman was anything but a pleasant. For one thing, she was bored. She was accustomed to the constant bustle of a great plantation in South Carolina, and then the constant bustle of European life. She wasn't yet caught up in the, in the life of the city. She 
complained of boredom, she complained of loneliness, she hated Washington, she hated politics, she hardly left their rooms except for meals, she refused to visit the Congress because she said, I'm afraid I'll catch a bullet in the head. <laughs> and that, that fear is not all that far-fetched. And besides, she said, I, don't, I, I, I hear enough talk of politics at home as it is. But in spite of her protest, politics began finding their way into her letters home. Scarcely a week after she reached Washington, she began passing on Kit's analysis of the struggle to control the House of Representatives. She was sure the Democrats had, quote, overawed the black Republicans, and if the party would just withdraw its candidate for speaker, and the, the candidate was Thomas Bocock of, of Virginia, Southerners thought that he was too conservative, for the Northerners he was way too radical. Sue decided that he had no chance of winning the speakership, and if the Democrats would just put forward a man who would be acceptable to the know-nothings and to the Northern Democrats, he could win. But only if the Southern Democrats would unite behind him, and that wasn't going to happen. Sue's emerging interest in politics just may have resulted from realization that the game that Kit was playing was in total earnest and could end in tragedy, as of course it did. Kit had earlier warned the House that, I'm quoting, I will shatter the Republic from turret to foundation stone rather than let it fall into the hands of the black Republicans. Writing in mid-December, still 1859, Sue revealed her fears and Kit's desperation. We are having frightful times here. War can break out at any moment and there is no way to know who might fall. She's obviously thinking of her husband. Roger Pryor, who was a radical Democratic congressman from Virginia, and Thomas Klingman, another radical Democratic fire eater, this one from North Carolina. Pryor and Klingman had just left her parlor to return to the house, and Kit had gone with them, and all three men were armed to the teeth. This is Sue Kit. Boy knives and revolvers are the constant companions of every Southern member. They were determined to fight to the knife right there on the floor of Congress and either take possession of the Capitol or fall. Fortunately, midway through December, things began to look a little better, at least for Sue Kitt. President Buchanan inaugurated the new social season and provided Sue with a temporary relief from her fears. And the kids were caught up in that endless round of receptions and dinners and balls and all the rest of it. In the beginning, Sue was very reluctant to become involved. But her friends told her that the president was eager to meet her. But she said, I have no fancy for that storytelling old man, meaning Buchanan. Christmas approached. She had still not paid her first call on the White House, which was a gross breach of ethics, of course, because the Victorian social code insisted that, that, that juniors pay first calls on, on their superiors. All they had to do was leave a, call, a calling card and run, but she hadn't even done that. So she hadn't been to the White House. James Slidell, a radical, I should say, sexually depraved senator from Louisiana, from Louisiana <laughs> told Buchanan that she was, quote, one of the handsomest women who had ever been to Washington, and the president was demanding to meet her. And Kit insisted that she go. And so she did. At the White House, she met Harriet Lane, whom I mentioned already. She pronounced Miss Lane fine looking, agreeable, but decidedly not handsome. She may have known that Kit had uh, kept company with Miss Lane and was just a trifle jealous, although I doubt it, because Miss Lane really wasn't uh, handsome. <laughs> Buchanan made himself, as she put it, as charming as he is able, 
and pressed her to come back often. <laughs> this is Sue describing Buchanan. He had one of the most quizzical faces I ever saw. Head and mouth twisted to one side, and then the erratic performance of that famous eye. I should perhaps explain that he had a wandering eye, and that in, in order to look at her, he had to tip his head <laughs> so that he could look at her with his good eye. <laughs> Imagine a politician today with that problem. <laughs> Christmas Day, 1859, was very, very dull. Kit went off to dine with the South Carolina delegation to the Congress, leaving her alone. And he didn't reappear until 2 a.m. the next morning. Sue was, of course, furious. Kit saved himself by describing part of the evening's conversation. Over brandy and cigars, Senator James H. Hammond, who was the junior senator from South Carolina, who ultimately sacrificed his political career by being too moderate. Senator Hammond had conceded that his wife, as he put it, lacked style. Well, that's really not all his life his wife lacked. Catherine Hammond was probably the homeliest woman in South Carolina. <laughs> Her father was one of the richest men in South Carolina, and that almost certainly explains why Hammond married her. Before she was married, uh, a young man is supposed to have said that he wouldn't marry her if every pimple on her face was worth a million dollars. <laughs> But Sue, <laughs> but Hammond said, Sue had style, beauty, and high training, and Kit must make himself worthy of her. Well, after that, Sue asked her mother, how could she possibly stay angry at her husband? And she didn't. And the events of the next few weeks wiped out the memory of that disappointing Christmas. The kids moved into new and more spacious rooms at the Lafayette House, Washington Hotel. They gave a dinner for a, do a dozen congressmen. Sue was a guest of honor at a dinner given by the Russian ambassador, and another dinner given by the cabinet, and a ball thrown by the German ambassador, and dined repeatedly at the White House. And Sue absolutely loved her conquest of Washington society. This is Kit writing to Sue's mother. She had a beautiful success. The president has taken a chivalric devotion to her and was telling anyone who would listen that she was the most cultivated and fascinating woman he had ever met in Washington. Kit obviously enjoying his wife's success. And finally, somehow, Sue found time to visit a session of Congress. She was absolutely horrified. What she saw clearly unnerved her. In a letter home, she, she asked a series of questions. She didn't bother to answer the questions because they were so, the answer was so obvious. This is Sue Kitt. Was this disorderly mob really the Congress of the United States? <laughs> the assembled wisdom of the nation, the legislators of a mighty people? Could wise resolves or noble enterprises really come from lawmakers such as these? Well, as I say, she didn't answer the questions because the questions answered themselves. And in time, the constant activity, whether parties or visits to the White House or visits to the Congress lost their appeal. This is Sue writing home again. I am heartily sorry. I am heartily tired of this Washington life. Dinners and balls one after another, receptions almost every day. Congressmen's wives did nothing but visit and talked about nothing but politics. They called once, and if she didn't immediately return their cards, they were offended. 
It took all her time to return their calls and all her money to hire carriages and all for people who cared nothing for her and she didn't care for them either. The city was full of, I'm quoting again, rowdy congressmen, importunate office seekers, fast young ladies, and insipid dancing young men. Not at all the sort of people she wanted for friends. But when Washington threatened to suffocate Sue, she turned to a handful of close friends. She was particularly fond of the Hammonds. You know, I'm going to wonder out loud if Sue was aware of the senator's uh, appalling reputation. Hammond was repeatedly unfaithful to his wife. He had an affair with a slave he owned. Uh, he had a daughter by the slave woman. He may have had an affair with his own daughter. He had so compromised the three nieces of Wade Hampton that they could never marry. Uh, Wade Hampton himself threatened to shoot Hammond, and Hammond, well, basically Hammond hid in his own home, perhaps under his own bed. Wade Hampton ran Hammond out of politics. Uh, back, this was back in the 1830s. He had recovered his reputation by the 1850s. And then tragedy. Early in the spring of 1860, Kit learned that his brother had been murdered by his own slaves. Kit, of course, went to Florida to see about his brother's affairs. And while he was away, Sue wrote a truly extraordinary letter to two political manipulators. Uh, one of them was a man named George N. Sanders. Uh, Taylor claims him as, as a relative, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> they, they fit. <laughs> a letter to George N. Sanders and A.D. Banks. These two men were managing Stephen Douglas's campaign for the presidency. Now, only months earlier, Sue had been denouncing politics and politicians, and now she told these two men that her husband was the ideal running mate for Stephen Douglas. The problem was Douglas had totally alienated the conservative South by opposing the admission of Kansas to the Union as a slave state. And Kit realized that, Sue Kit realized, that, that in order to win the nomination for president, much less win the election, Douglas was going to have to get back into the good graces of the South. She said, Douglas can win back the support of the South only by putting an ultra on the ticket. An ultra who could deliver the Southern vote. And who should that be? Well, to Sue, the answer was absolutely obvious. Now she's going from wanting to get completely away from politics to, to being the wife of the Vice President of the United States. Now Sanders answered that Hammond would be the strongest candidate. And Sue insisted that he was wrong. Hammond, I'm quoting, Hammond was a man whose appetite is a thing of the greatest moment, whose splendid intellect is the slave of a damaged liver and a morbid spleen, a man effete, blazed, rusted out. Hammond was afraid Douglas would involve the country in a foreign war. She believed that a foreign war was the only way to save the country, to, as she put it, relieve the internal brawls and quell the home conflicts and smooth away the sectional jealousies and save the republic. If this sounds like William H. Seward, it should. So months, a month earlier, she had been pathetically grateful to the Hammonds for saving her from the buffeting of the big city, and now she was dragging the senator through the mud to advance the political fortunes of her husband. And of course, Sue didn't want to save the republic. Like Kit, she wanted to break it up. 
What she did want was for Kit to have a place on the Democratic ticket in 1860. She believed that the vice presidency of the old union would be a springboard into the presidency of the new one. Of course it didn't happen. Kit wasn't nominated to run for vice president at Charleston in April, but then neither was Douglas. Kit was not elected president of the United States. The Democratic Party broke in half. The northern half, Douglas's half, didn't nominate Kit, but the southern half didn't nominate him either. And of course, the split of the party made the election of Abraham Lincoln virtually inevitable. Historians really don't like that word inevitable, but I can't imagine how it could have held together at this point. Because the election made, the, made Lincoln uh, president, and Lincoln's presidency made the secession of the southern states virtually unavoidable. And Kit and others led South Carolina out of the Union and sat in the convention that formed the Confederate States of America, served on the committee that drafted the first Confederate Constitution. He sat in the first Confederate Congress, but he was bored to death because all the glory was out there on the battlefield. And so he resigned his seat and raised the 20th South Carolina Infantry and spent most of the war defending Charleston Harbor. Late in the spring of 1864, the 20th South Carolina went north to join Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia, just in time for the Battle of Cold Harbor. Now, poor kid. He had spent about three years in the trenches around Charleston Harbor. He had no experience fighting in the field at all. He was still, his image of the Civil War was still, climb on your horse, draw your saber, and charge straight ahead. Well, the armies weren't fighting the war that way anymore. The second day that Kit was in command now of a brigade, the brigade commander, who a superb officer, was promoted to division command. Kit was the senior officer in the brigade. He took over the brigade. He was given a mission of uh, 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 feeling a, a union position. He should have done it with a company or maybe a squad. And he lined up his entire brigade in, in battle formation and charged straight ahead. The brigade was shot to bits, and, and Kit was mortally wounded and died the next day. And after Kit's death, Sue disappeared from, from, the, from the historical record, uh, or at least the record as I've been able to find it, except for two letters whom Sue Kit wrote to the Reconstruction governor of South Carolina, a man named Benjamin Perry. Perry was telling Sue that she had to take the oath of allegiance to the federal government or the government would seize her land, and she was saying she'd be damned into hell before she'd do that. Only she kept the land, so I assume she ultimately uh, uh, took the oath. Well, I assume that that was the end of the story. Uh, it certainly was the end of the story for my dissertation, but after 35 years, and I wasn't terribly pleased with the dissertation, and I was spending all my time preparing lectures here anyway, and I put the thing on the shelf and it stayed there, as I say, for 35 years, when Bill Freeling suggested that I take it out and strong arm me into doing that, and I went back to the subject. And I think it was three summers ago, I stumbled into an amazing collection of letters at the South Carolina Library uh, on the campus of the University of South Carolina, and all of a sudden, Sue was alive again uh, in an exchange of letters with the Irish, I assume, nouveau riche owner of, of a general store, the prototypical crossroads store in, in, in uh, upcountry South Carolina. 
Sue Kitt's father died in 1878, leaving the plantation in terrible shape and in terrible debt. Uh, and the local court ordered the plantation sold to pay the debts. And here's where the, the Scarlet O'Hara business comes, comes to, the for, for, to the front for me. Sue was absolutely determined to hold on to the land. Now she didn't have to hitch up her sisters to the plow the way Scarlett did, but she almost did. Well, she didn't have sisters there, so she couldn't. She borrowed money from the storekeeper and bought back the land at auction and set out to restore its antebellum prosperity. That is, before Sherman's army had swept through, Sherman didn't burn the plantation house, but he destroyed everything else. Sherman had already uh, destroyed uh, Lawrence Kitt's plantation just outside of St. Matthews. So Sue Kitt, without any experience of actually running a plantation, set out to restore the plantation. In the beginning, she knew essentially nothing about the day-to-day -day operation of a cotton plantation, and she relied very heavily on the advice of the store owner, only she realized fairly quickly that he was not her friend, that the advice that he was giving her was not good advice at all. I think what must have told her was that he had loaned her the money to buy back the plantation at 18% interest, and had loaned her more money in order to restore the plantation at 40%. I find it absolutely amazing that she could pay that sort of interest in, in that economic climate and still succeed. But she had to borrow money to build tenant houses and erect fences and buy mules and buy plows and, and lure back tenants. And she does seem to have, have been a, an unusually good um, uh, plantation owner in the sense that she treated her black tenants well to the extent that when the tenants of other cotton planters in the area were leaving for Kansas in 1879, uh, her stayed. But I'm getting ahead of the story because of course she missed payments and the storekeeper threatened to foreclose and she pleaded and she wept copious tears and she raged and she threatened I will come back, I will kill myself, this actually in one letter, I will kill myself and I will come back and, and I will haunt you into your grave. <laughs> and I'm sure she meant it. And she persevered and, and she succeeded. She prospered. She paid her debts. She saved her land. She actually increased the original prosperity of the land. She and Kit had grown up in the Methodist church. She became an Episcopalian. <laughs> Before Kit's death, uh, the two of them had had two daughters. One of them died in infancy, I think, from, from um, uh, pneumonia, but I can't be sure. The, the other one lived, and somehow Sue Kitt found the money to educate her um, at what was then Augusta Female Academy, which is now Mary Baldwin College. Um, Sue introduced her daughter into society. She took her daughter on a tour of the spas in Virginia, which is where you went to catch a man. She toured the debutante ball circuit in Washington and New York, and it looks as if she almost married her off to Grover Cleveland, which would have been, I think, a fate worse than death. <laughs> the daughter never married, and I think she was far better off uh, than, than marrying Grover Cleveland. There have been a lot of really boring presidents in American history, but I think Grover Cleveland comes in first. <laughs> The two women traveled through Europe and North Africa 
and really fulfill the dreams that Sue had cherished before the war. And when she died, she left an estate worth more than a quarter of a million dollars, which was an absolutely enormous sum for a woman who had been widowed in the Civil War and virtually penniless a half century before. And you can object, as Becky has, that, that she wasn't really penniless. She owned a lot of land, but uh, she was decidedly land poor. She had made herself into, I believe, a real-life Scarlett O'Hara, and she proved she didn't need Rhett Butler to do it. <laughs> Thank you.